Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Not as colourful as the apple, really, is it? No, but it won't be up for as long. <laughs> right. Okay. I've decided we're going to start now. Hello. People will still drift in. I realise that. Uh, thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Right to Be Forgotten question mark. I'm Timandra Hartness. I'm chairing this panel. Mainly, we've decided because I'm the one with the most difficult name to pronounce. This way, only I have to say it. Uh, we've got a panel of four great speakers, and then we will allow lots of time for you guys to pitch in. If you're watching this on the live feed, apparently you can send your questions in via Twitter. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, you can send your questions via Twitter with the hashtag Solo14. Uh, and we've got people in the room standing by to field your questions. And yes, relay. and don't forget for this particular session, it's Solo14 Forget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for this session it's Remember 7 14 it. forget. Yes. Don't forget that. Right, good. Uh, so the speakers are going to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Uh, when they get to 9 minutes, they get a yellow card. When they get to 10 minutes, they get a red card. When they get to 11 minutes, they get a small electric shock. <laughs> Sadly, they don't. Uh, I'm telling you this because I have known audience members to go on for so long that they also require a yellow and red card. So be warned. Uh, so we're coming in, but we're going, to, we're going to start now. Are there any other housekeeping things you need to say? Please switch your phones to silent, but obviously feel free to tweet, otherwise there'll be very little point in having a hashtag, etc., etc. So, uh, in the order in which they're going to speak, our four speakers are John Gilby. His beards all look the same to me, I'm sorry. John Gilby, science and science fiction writer. He teaches computer science, uh, and he says he does other stuff, but there are other John Gilby's online and not all of them are him. And if that doesn't set you all running for Google, I don't know what will. Uh, then we have Josh Brown, European Director of ORCID, the Open Research and Contributor Identifier. Cameron Nalen, uh, who, tends to, who does direct advocacy about open things for PLOS <laughs> and describes himself as a recovering researcher. So I'm not sure whether we're going to get a, a talk or some kind of therapy. Uh, and then finally, Kenneth Kukie, uh, who's the data editor of The Economist and the author of a very fine book called Big Data, which I recommend to people anyway. Uh, but apparently he has two children who keep needing new shoes, so you really have to buy it. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll be barefoot, which would be a sad thing. Uh, but to start us off, John, would you like to? Because you. you're up to 10 minutes. Right. There will now be a brief technical hiatus when I break this and then try and mend something else. Or something along those lines. Right. I'm sure there's a better. Full screen mode? That sounds about right. Good afternoon, London. Good afternoon. Oh, oh thank you. Someone's alive. Right. I hope one of them's me. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, my name's John Gilby. And as you'll see from the screen, I am confused or maybe bewildered. I was too uncertain to actually uh, worry about it. Data privacy and stuff like it is complex. And every time I turn around and look at it, it gets more complex, uh, which takes some getting used to. You get to my age, you start worrying about this sort of stuff. So I thought I'd put my thoughts on, on paper or electronic paper or whatever it is, this technical stuff to try and um, bring forward some of my thoughts so that you can then shoot them down in flames and I can leave early, which is great. Right. Uh, oh, yes. Interactive bit. Show of hands. Recorded regrets. Regrets that we have that have been recorded by the interweb, this wonderful technical thing that's all around us. Hands up if you've done things to others you now regret via the medium of the internet. Okay, a few, a few honest people. Okay. <laughs> How many of us have had things done to us by others that we very much regret on the interweb? Yeah. How many of us? How many of us have shot ourselves in the foot or any other bodily part by doing something or posting something on the internet that we then very much regret? <laughs> right. Well, I'm not going to tell you what mine was, <laughs> but it's on the last slide. So, just to keep you in the room. Um, so, forgetting in the sense of what we're talking about, I understand to be limited to inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, or excessive data under the EU definitions of such things. But there's a caveat, excessive data, and then it wanders on um, in the context of the requirements of the data processing 
that is being undertaken. So there's already a spready bit there. There are things that could happen even outside this rather limited uh, opportunity for being forgotten. So I get, I get very, um, pardon me, I've been edited. It's worrying. <laughs> There's a whole screen of stuff there. Right. Okay. As a computer science person, I, I teach computers. <laughs> I teach computers. I'm a fellow of the British Computer Society. You can tell, can't you? Right. Um, yes. There's a triumvirate of essential things for information security management, which is one of the things I teach, embarrassingly. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the three big threads of the ISO standard for information security management. It's ISO 27000 if you want to look up the family of stuff. CIA, it's you know, the acronym, conspiracy theorists Q here. Um, the core of this is data quality and data availability are sacrosanct to the sort of people I teach, really nerdy people, you know, with, you know, mountain boots and, you know, bad haircuts and stuff like this. People who are looking after your data. And I'm not referring to any of my colleagues here, obviously. Um, as a web services consumer, we're all web services consumers. We're also other things. If we aren't paying, we're not the customer of the organization. We're being used by the, by the organization to sell to other people. The big data thing, which my esteemed colleague here will no doubt be referring to in subliminal detail later. There's no such thing as a free lunch. All these wonderful free services that we use every day. And who doesn't use a free service? Very few people. Um, generates big data for someone else, and we become a commodity. I, I, I am, as a customer or as a consumer of it, I don't like that necessarily. And it's increasingly difficult to operate online without using some of these services. When was the last time you downloaded an app and it didn't ask for your location information, your contacts, your blood group, your inside leg measurement, your DNA profile? They all do now, even if it's only telling you the time of the next bus. That is something I object to. I'm a very angry old man, you can tell. Can you? Oh, come on, this isn't playing the game. Mm. Wait up. Tell me if I get too professional, by the way. <laughs> I told you to break it. Where are we on? No, it's in, it's in PDF. It's well, PDF can't break. <laughs> this would be the free reader service. Computer says no. Let's try escape. And then go back up. All, all the way back up. <coughs> Can you pause the clock just for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I'll get... <laughs> Not my computer. <laughs> You know, this is embarrassing. The gentleman in the middle of the front row is chairing the next panel. Used to be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's try PowerPoint. How am I doing, Dave? <laughs> I think we've just got the right to forget all that. <laughs> See what he did there? These episodes like this make me think. Either the singularity is already here and it doesn't want us to see that. Right. Or Whoa. it will never happen. <laughs> right. That's what I was going to show you. That one there. Oh, anyway. Right. Big data, blah, blah, blah. We talked about that. Right. Hands up if you're a writer or a communicator or... Right, be proud. Come on. <laughs> or a communicator or a new media person. Or, right. So this is the core, this is the core market, really. Um, so, I, dis I disagree with having people using my data in exchange for a free service. But, when I'm a freelance writer, privacy is something of an enemy to me. I always have this wondering, if, if I wasn't on the web, would editors commission me to do stuff? How much is based on my previous work and how much is people I've met at conferences to say, who's the, who's the weird uh, bearded bloke who couldn't use PowerPoint? We'll use, we'll use him for the next one. Um, <laughs> I have different personas when I write different things. Here's the advert. Um, I, I do stuff for the, the Guardian Country Diary. I'm in next Monday, buy a copy. Don't just use the one online. 
although if the one online is a photograph as well. Um, I do wonderful academic reviews and satire for Times Higher, and I also write science fiction for Nature and stuff like that. So these are different people. Which John Gilby is standing before you now? Am I wearing a jacket because I'm trying to give some integrity to the role, you know, some academic sort of status, or do I just need more pockets for all the memory sticks that don't actually work? Um, is what you see what you get? Which John Gilby am I? And I'm not the councillor in Canterbury, which some of you probably found by now. Um, I'm not the bloke that makes weird films, and I'm not the guy who does the um, martial arts stuff. Um, they all make <laughs> more money than me. So, um, but anyway, in terms of privacy as a writer, there's this sort of duality between public interest and public curiosity. Makes you, makes you wonder. So, just when I thought my lives as an IT person, um, an information security interested person, um, freelance writer of all these different genres, couldn't, couldn't get much more complicated than that. And then I discovered medical data through an interesting, an interesting um, set of circumstances. Um, just after the last time I came to this conference, no connection, I'm sure, I was diagnosed with cancer. Three operations later, I'm on my feet, everything's fine, but I find that my public and private persona in terms of medical stuff has merged, which is very strange. My privacy, in my view, has been trumped by wider benefits. Someone comes up to you and says, I think I can help you live longer. You say, take my data. Yes, why not share it? Yes, I'll join that clinical trial. Yes, you can quote me on that. Um, I'm happy to share personal data, not entirely altruistically, I want to help my children, obviously, in case they share this trait that I've developed. Um, and I want to help the population of people with this disease fight it. But here's the thing you see, the NHS has kept me really, really confidential, which even in a small town like ours is something of an achievement. Sensitive personal data under the meaning of the information of the Data Protection Act is a very special category of stuff. Now, I'd be happy to share a lot more of my medical data with insurance companies if it gave them a tighter idea of how healthy I am. When I ask for travel insurance, they ask the same three or four questions, which are silly ones like, when did you last see your consultant? Not, what did your consultant say your results were? So I'm happy to move a lot more sensitive data into the public domain if I can get a benefit from it in the same way as I can from free Google Maps. You know, pre googled tumour maps, perhaps, I don't know. Um, so, that's really the journey. I'm a lot of different people. Everybody in privacy terms is a different person in a different part of the day. And I'm happy to debate any of these little details with you. Now you see, I've been edited. That was going to be uh, my piece of information that I wanted hidden. And Microsoft has hidden it for me. I think that's the very, very first time. <laughs> if anybody wants to know at the end of the session, what the, I have a paper copy which you can come and have a look at. But I've now prevented it going onto the interweb. That's rather, rather surreal, Maybe. isn't it, really? Yes. Um, but yes, I'm happy to discuss. Let's have a discussion. Thank you very much, John. And I hardly had to give you any extra time for the technical difficulties. Uh, well, lots of provocative questions thrown up there. So, Josh, what can you add to embroil the scenario? Well, I'm beginning to wonder which John Gilby I am. I think, as a as a topic, the right to be forgotten is a very strange topic. The whole situation is is, is full of all sorts of bizarre circumstances, like the fact that the, the test case that went to the European Court of Justice ended up producing the most epic example of the Streisand effect ever. Somebody wanted something forgotten, now it's attached in the first paragraph of every single news discussion of the right to be forgotten. Um, it's odd in that it's opposing essentially a geographical um, solution to a perceived problem on a network that was designed to work and route around missing nodes and make sure that the flow of information was maintained and it resulted in a nuclear attack. And it's particularly bizarre to me that we're talking about the right to be forgotten. And 
it's not the right to be forgotten that we're really actually addressing. It's a balance between the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression, freedom of speech. And we don't really have a right to be forgotten in the same sense that you have a human right as defined by the European Union or the United Nations or Rousseau or anyone else. These rights come from a very different place to the right to be forgotten. So we use data services every day, as John was saying, and they collect a huge amount of data about us. And even where we're not explicitly trading off um, an improved service, so Google now scanning your email to tell you when you have a flight coming up, and then checking your location, and then saying, you might want to go now, there's a bus in 10 minutes that will get you to the airport just in time. That's quite useful. You trade that off. You let Google read your emails, or scan them automatically in order to get that convenience, and that's fine. That's, that's a known trade-off. And it's the same with Facebook and everything else. If you're using this without realizing that you are the product and you are just basically um, a, a target for advertising, then you probably shouldn't be using them. Um, but I think what's interesting about the right to be forgotten is it doesn't touch any of those things. They relate to it. Um, but as it's expressed, it's about things that have been published or stated about you. And that's very different. And that's the point where I think, one, asking someone like Google to make decisions about what is in the public interest, what is in your interest, to, uh, to be the arbiter in those, in, those, in, those, in those discussions and those decisions is very troubling. That really worries me. That, it doesn't strike me that Google is the place for those decisions to be taken. Um, it's not clear to me that if an investigative journalist produces a story about somebody and they feel that it is excessive or it goes too far or they question the accuracy of it, investigative journalism is about uncovering the unknown. Um, it might not be possible to get all of it absolutely right on the first time it's published. If someone wants to have that taken down, they can take out a lot of accurate information on the argument that the story contains a small amount of inaccurate information. You can claim that, um, what that, 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 that if you give individuals the right to censor, in effect, the public record without redress and without meaningful defined right of appeal to a global corporation whose business is in linking data, who can link that data from another country anyway, because it's only in Europe that you can't link to these things. So they could, you could just use google.com and get to the same information. You're mixing up um, a huge amount of moral, political, legal, um, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think actually quite important philosophical questions in there. What is a right? Um, how should we be free to exercise that right? Um, when, at what point do I become a public figure? If I use Twitter, am I a public figure? If I appear on a reality TV show, am I a public figure? I appear on a reality TV show, does that matter? Um, but if, as a politician, it's pretty obvious that I'm a public figure and there is a public interest in my behaviour. As, oh, I don't know, the head, of, the, the, the head of legal counsel for Google, I think I am a public figure and I, people should take an interest in what I'm doing. As me sitting here talking to you, I am a public figure. Me as a private individual, I'm not. At what point does the story relate to me at what point, do, which, which point can you cut that off and how can you make hard and fast rules about when I have a point, I have a right to pull back from the public sphere and prevent other people from placing me in the public sphere? And I don't think that those questions have been adequately addressed. I don't think that they should be mixed up in the same way that we would look at, say, the um, Adobe sending reading information back from e-readers who are using Adobe software. I don't think we should look at it in the same way as Amazon collecting a phenomenal amount of information about us all. There are data brokers in the US who collect details from all your actions and transactions online. There's the NSA, um, the, 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 the G GCHQ, spy agencies all over the world collecting a huge amount of private data about us. And we have no recourse over that. We have no idea what they're doing with it. And that is far more worrying. But at the same time, um, it's some, it, people will focus on stuff, the things that they can do something about. Now, the question is, are we actually asking people to do something about the right thing? 
how can we unpick those questions? And what is a better solution than a slightly ba a badly expressed right to be forgotten for the fact that we have most of us, as the internet has evolved, made a right mess of our online existence and identity. Thank you very much. <laughs> so disappointed I didn't even get to give the yellow card then. It's so concise and to the point. Uh, Cameron, that wasn't an invitation to overrun me. Yeah. So my name's Cameron. I'm a recovering academic. Um, I'm also less funny than John, so that, that, that's about as humorous as I could get. Um, but I guess to pick up on both both those previous points, so, you know, in a sense, I'm I'm three, at least three people. Um, I'm a person who got a lot out of being relatively early into social media in the research and scholarly communication space, and that my career has depended on being in those spaces and being public and making connections and building networks. I'm a citizen um, concerned uh, about increasing surveillance, observation, uh, intrusion into my life, while at the same time I'm wearing this device on my wrist, which is measuring my heart rate at the moment and updating it to Google. Um, so conflicted and confused um, in many ways. Um, but I wanted to focus on the question of, of the researcher. Um, and the, quest, the extent to which the researcher is a public person or has an ob obligation to be public. So back when I was doing work in the lab, I was pretty extreme when it came to transparency and, and the publicness of what I was doing. Um, with a small group of other people, um, I was involved in what we called open notebook science. This meant my lab notebook was online. Um, there was no other record except for what was publicly available online um, at the moment in which I recorded it. So my, my research played out in a, in a public space and was commented on and discussed in, in public spaces in real time. And for me at the time, and still today, um, given that I was funded uh, pretty much entirely from public money, from taxpayers' money, um, and given that the business of, of research is to create, in my view, public goods, um, as the first priority, and private goods as a side effect, perhaps, but public goods as our, as, our, as our first target, that there is a real obligation to not just uh, create those returns, not just to take the money and the investment that the public makes on us and do our best to convert that into value for the community, um, different kinds of value, different types of value, but value nonetheless. Um, but also to be public about the doing of it so that those decisions that we make about what to do, where to put our resources and how to communicate it are transparent and can be criticised uh, by the public, the publics um, that are involved in um, paying. And we're paying my salary and now today are, are indirectly paying my salary, arguably. So that's, a, that's kind of an easy case, a political case to make, that we that the researcher is, has an obligation, the publicly funded researcher has an obligation to be public in some sense. Um, but where do those boundaries lie? There are clear cases where being public is actually a, a risk to the researcher. Um, in this country in particular, those people involved in certain kinds of animal research um, and indeed you know, research with national security implications, if their address and names are made public, they are at personal risk. Um, and I think it's legitimate for them to have some expectation of safety. Um, the question of whether that research should be done at all is, is a separate one, I and mean, we might perhaps disagree about that. But given that that research is being done and is being publicly funded as part of our public research enterprise, it's reasonable for those people to have an expectation of personal safety. Other people involved in clinical trials and other things, there are, there are a range of of spaces where it's inappropriate to make that data available immediately, either again because it, it might um, impinge on the safety or health of people in members of the public, um, but also because it could damage the process of the research itself. So I think this is where it starts to get interesting and where my views have actually changed over the last few years. Um, I like working very much transparently and very much in the public, but what I have learned is that it's important to take the time and to create safe spaces to think in private or in partial 
private spaces, with small communities where there's safety, where you can explore without necessarily feeling that everything you do is going to be publicly criticised, that everything you're going to do is going to be torn apart because you're still working it out for yourself. And it's a very human thing to need that space to work it out for yourself. So I think it's important that in intellectual endeavours that we preserve those spaces. The problem that we have with the spaces that we occupy online and where we have some of those conversations is that frankly we don't know when we're being in public and when we are being public. I'm sure most of us have experience from our childhood of having a conversation in a playground or a coffee shop or a bar which was overheard and spread beyond the private conversation that was occurring in a public space. Um, and we kind of have in the back of our heads a way of thinking about that. And perhaps the people who are young enough to have been brought up in the environment where there has been social media for you know, most of your lives, have a sense of how to navigate that issue in those spaces. Certainly, I highly recommend Dana Boyd's um, book called It's Complicated, as digging into the questions of people who are managing the process of becoming public people, teenagers, and the way they negotiate these online spaces that are partially public, partially private, and how they manage that process. We're figuring out how to do that, and it's a hard problem, and it's a hard problem for people in general, and it's a particularly hard problem for researchers. But that example or that event, which I'm sure most of us have seen, where we're in an online forum which is technically public and a conversation is going on and then someone posts that conversation elsewhere and people get upset. I've seen that happen over and over again. The expectations that people have of the spaces where they're playing and conversing, where they feel safe, where they feel that they're talking to a specific community and then someone breaks down the barrier are a real problem. We heard this morning about the notion of live tweeting in research conferences and scientific conferences and how that's, again, breaking down barriers. And it struck me as that conversation occurred over the, the last week that five years ago, I was one of those people who said, no, God damn it, so you can't tell us we can't tweet. Because there were like five of us and maybe there were 20 people out there and we were telling the people in power that we wanted to communicate. Now, the, the, the power structure has changed. The people who are saying, no, you can't stop us tweeting, have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 50,000 followers. And the people who are just wanting to talk to their own small community about their own issues are being forcibly made public. So I don't have any answers. I think they're, they're, they're tough questions. I think the only thing that I've found over the past five years is that it's really dangerous to make assumptions whenever you're in a space which could become public, that we need to have the conversation. We need to talk about what the expectations are. The benefit of having that conversation is that in doing it, you create community. You create spaces in which people have shared expectations. And when people have shared expectations, we have a good opportunity to have a reasonable conversation, to know what the parameters are, and to make a choice collectively about when to become more public. But coming back to where I started, that's not just a choice for us researchers sitting in the ivory tower. That's also a conversation that the wider public, again, the people who are paying our salaries, directly and indirectly, also have a reasonable right to have a stake in. So the question of whether a researcher or how much a researcher is obliged to be a public person and in what times and in what spaces and where the research community has a reasonable expectation of having its own conversations and where we need to engage with the wider <coughs> community and, uh, and open up those of the communication, I think is, is a really valuable part of the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're all keeping to time marvellously. I, I feel I should have four cupcakes to give out to reward you all at the end. Uh, and lots of questions. I hope, if, by the way, when, when we do come out for all of you, it's not just going to be so you can ask questions, it's also so you can throw in opinions and answer questions. So I hope if you've got answers to any of these, I hope you're making a mental note of them ready. So can you uh, either pull all those things together or give us some new things to worry about, Ken? 
uh, I think it's been a very interesting uh, set of ideas put forward already so far, and I'll try my best to kind of find a, a new path through. I think so far, what we're hearing, there's an interesting consensus that's forming. Uh, Josh put it nicely as sort of the mess of identity. Uh, but in this instance, uh, the difference here is, on one hand, we're talking about the, the so these overlapping identities, and then as Cameron put it, the overlapping spaces. So for John, the mess of identity was by um, the feature of the work that you're doing. I'm a science fiction writer. No, I'm now a science writer. These are different things. For Josh, it was uh, temporal. It was context. Um, even the lawyer of Google, who is a public person speaking about Google, is not a public is, is a private person when it's about him as an individual. And so the internet doesn't make a distinction between those two contexts. But of course, we would, as human beings, we need to build a regulatory system that allows for it. In the case of Cameron, it's about um, spaces where things that are fine in one context are different than another. I'd like to pick up on something that Josh said and maybe uh, dive a little further through it. And that is the idea um, of the right to be forgotten, is it really a right and is it really forgetting that we want? Um, his point was well taken. Uh, it's that it's not really a right in the way that we have a right. And what we're really talking about is a compromise between the right for free expression on one side and the right for privacy on the other. And we're using the term forgetting to do that. Um, I think that what we need to, now to build on that point, um, I think that we, what we need to do is to understand that the whole idea of a right to be forgotten is an imperfection, that it is a deliberate erosion of the technology and of the integrity of information, that it is an attempt to balance values, but it's not to say that this is the value. This is an attempt to balance different competing values. And in fact, if, if we were to put a value to it, we could say that actually this is a lesser value to what I would argue will be the higher value. And the higher value will be the integrity of information and information itself. But let me get there. Um, why is it not a, uh, a right? Why is it a simply a hack to the problem? Is because it is a regulatory compromise. Because the default, situ the default situation of our reality has switched because of technology. But we never understood that these were tech, that, that the environment that we lived in was a function of the technology that we had, specifically. All throughout time, information uh, has eroded with time, like a rock would erode with weather, uh, that our memory would decay similarly. Okay? It would lapse with time. We now have technical tools. And that was, of course, a function of, in case, neurology on one side, but of course, of the, of the instruments that we have, the artifacts with which we try to remember. And the, the pantheonic book there is by Victor Mayer Schoenberger called Delete the Virtue of Forgetting in a Digital Age. He makes that point beautifully. Uh, full disclosure, he's also the co author of the book Big Data, but I'd say that anyway. Right. I'm in a friend. The, the technology obviously allows us to overcome some of those obstacles in a way that can have negative consequences. So we have computers, we have the internet, and we have search, and information now can be, always be present all the time in a way that it never could before. So that's new, okay? So we have to understand that. What do we do when that's new? We have to understand that that creates a new harm. It creates a new victimization, a tyranny of information where information is so omnipresent that it's so persistent that it actually becomes a burden to us. It shackles us to the past. We need a solution and the solution is a regulatory solution. So we create law to intervene and to dumb it down in the same way as you could imagine any other technology that could be very powerful but we don't have the right institutions or the right culture to interact with it, that we would need a regulatory system that would throttle it. But it is a throttling, it's a dumbing down of the technology. What should the principle be if we were to start from first principles in this new world of, uh, of, of abundant data, big data? Well, I would argue that the principle should be not less information, but more information. It should be all information all the time. And then if there is a problem, we have to remedy that problem. So we can imagine what would the inverse look like? The inverse to a world in which we have the right to be forgotten is that we will have the imperative of ubiquitous information, that all information that's ever generated has to be stored. It has to be saved. It has to be put to use in the best way that can be exploited 
uh, in, in for, for society's benefit. So it, it wouldn't be open data per se, because that sounds like an anarchistic approach to data, but it would be a way with which the data would be put to society's benefit and that we would keep it, manage it, understand the provenance, and certify its accuracy as best as we can. So what would it look like for medical records? Well, in the case of John, uh, his medical records that he wants shared could go into a commons with which all researchers everywhere could learn that this is what the telltale signs of a cancer that's creeping and starting to form looks like. This is the best way that we've treated it, and we will learn new things if we do that. It is a no-brainer. We all know that, so we don't have to, I don't have to make that argument. We, we treat the information around patient, patient care like we treat the bandages around the patient, and we throw it out after the treatment, and it's going to look heinous to our grandchildren. Okay, but you can extend that even further. What about crime records? I would argue yes. School records, certainly. Sure, we need some privacy protections. Let's have that debate. Let's build this new world. But the principle is the ubiquitousness of information. We might want to find that the solution has to be somehow making the records harder to access rather than either destroying it or making it inaccessible. Where does this end up? So much of life is about human values, and those human values we fail to recognize are functions of the technology with which we interact. And when we change the technical assumptions of, of the world, we need to, our values need to change as well. So in the case of free speech, keep in mind, we never had free speech rules. We never had laws to protect free speech before we had the printing press, because there just never was enough speech around that was worth protecting. It wasn't a value. When Socrates was hauled before the citizens of Athens for corrupting the youth, among his, uh, among his defense in the Apologia, he never raised the point of free speech because it didn't exist. You have the printing press, you have a cornucopia of information, you now recognize the value that information is the fabric of society and of innovation and of human knowledge and the advancement and progress of society, so we need rules to protect it. What it means for big data is that the value of the information in the world that we're in today because of our new tools and because of our new technical assumptions is that it, the data can be generated like never before and it can be used like never before. So I would argue that the first priority, the highest value is the creation and proper stewardship of this information. And I recognize that we do need a right to be forgotten, but as, let us not forget that it is actually an imperfection a deliberate regulatory hack with which we dumb down the technology, it's not the highest value itself. Thank you very much. And again, Marm, we can decide. So, I sincerely hope that's thrown up lots of questions to all of you, because it certainly has for me. So if you, if you don't all chip in, then you just give me free reign, basically. I've got so many things scribbled down here. Uh, what I'd like to do is take maybe a couple of points at a time and then let the panel come back because that way you get more of an input. Do we have a Roman microphone to go at? We do. Well, we have two Roman microphones. Excellent. So that's what we do. We'll take, start with taking one per microphone and see how we get on. And I might have to take more points at a time if, if the panel are too full in their responses. So who'd like to, who'd like to say something? Show us your hands. Oh, you can't all be dazzled by the amount of stuff that's been thrown at you. Who, who thinks that we should have a right to be forgotten enshrined in law? Give us a show of hands. <laughs> Two people at the back. Come on, I know you've all got your smartphones and your keyboards, but you are actually in the room. <laughs> I can see you. Good, okay. So who thinks we should have a right to be forgotten? Hands up. Quite a few people. Who thinks that we should not have a right to be forgotten? Okay, also quite a few people say so you all have opinions of some kind. So think of the question. Good, yes, lady of the microphone. I'm confused. I'm Jojo, by the way. Um, the right to be forgotten pertains to information that we want to get rid of from the web. It just reminds me a bit of 1984, George Orwell. Um, what is it that we're trying to forget? I, I know you probably uh, mentioned it a lot, but um, this is a fairly new subject uh, in the media and is that we're just trying to clean up the internet we're just trying to get rid of some data to what is it that we want to forget 
Is it, I mean, to me, stuff happens, we forget about it, but you can still look it up. Is it the stuff that we want to look up that's the problem? Um, can you basically dumb it down for me <laughs> and tell me what it is that we're discussing in very, very simple terms? Well, somebody put me right if I get this wrong, but as far as I understand it, it's a new European law that says that if there's something online about you that you think is wrong or in other way, in other way, any other way shouldn't be available to the public, you can ask for it to be removed from search results. So if somebody searches for my name and I don't want them to find the really bad review in Chortle from 1999, I could write to Google and say, you're smiling, you obviously read it, and, and say, I don't think this edit reflects my current performance level, so I'd like it removed. I don't know if that would be sufficient grounds, but... Well, the, the, standard, the standards actually, the standards, it's not idiotic, okay? The standard, the standard is higher and it's not Orwellian. So the best way to think about it is as an example. Imagine you have an 18-year-old kid who's arrested for dealing drugs uh, and goes to the precinct. Um, and it turns out, and the, the local newspapers um, write an article about him, about him being arrested for dealing drugs. Uh, and it turns out, actually, he didn't. He's completely innocent. But that news clip, whenever you Google his name, is the first thing anyone ever sees. And so now it's 15 years later. He's dating people, he's applying for jobs, and he just looks like he's a drug dealer, or worse. Now, he can say, wait a minute, how is it possible that it's, it's not that, this is, that the world revolves around me having been falsely accused when I was 18. It's actually that Google's search algorithm, which is man-made, not principled in any way. It's not sort of the nature of technology to have a search using the page rank algorithm. This is just the way it works. Um, always serves this up. I'm experiencing... Um, personal degradation and economic harm from this company that is simply saying, hey, it's just machine learning, honey. Take a walk, talk to the hand. That's bullshit. So I'm feeling it, I'm harmed legally, right? The, the um, I was, you know, I, maybe I was, maybe he was a minor. Let's even put, you know, make it even worse. Suddenly you could say, well, should there be redress? Well, in, uh, in Europe, they said yes. And Google immediately said fine, because the standard was gonna be so high that although they were going to get tens of thousands of requests, the only ones that will hit the bar will be the ones that are no-brainer cases where you, any reasonable person would be like, yeah, totally take it. You know, don't, we can disclose that we're not putting this information out so there. So would you say this was essentially a bandwagon? People just jumping on and go, hey, I want this removed. Yeah, Remove the, this, please. Yeah, but the point is that the law is written in such a way and why Google immediately went for it was because it was that anyone, everyone can say I'd rather have it offline but they're never gonna hit, hoop, go through all those hoops to get it offline. It's only someone who's very committed and who, where the harm is so obvious that most right-thinking people would say, yeah, this is pretty, this, this is a real imperfection of the way things go. Let's, let's, let's eliminate it from the search results. It's still there. It's just eliminated from the search results. Do I have any dissenting opinions uh, from the panel? No, you're all with that one. Uh, if you've got your hand up, you'd like to say something far away. Yes, I, I might be holding the microphone. I would like to ask a question. Um, I'm not sure that Google are necessarily the best gatekeepers for this process, but is there an appropriate gatekeeper? Who should be able to make these kind of decisions? Presumably, we don't want a full court case and try and effect every time someone wants something off the internet. Is there a good process for that? Well, I think this is a very good example of the... I mean, the wider issues which the panel raised in the introductions, the, the question of how public is public, if everything on the internet is effectively public because you can find it. But as you say, if something comes to the top of a web search every time somebody looks for your name, then is, is that giving undue salience to something? So it's not just out there, it's actually being thrown into somebody's lap. But, uh, but as you were saying, there are different arenas and something. So if I'm down the pub with my mates, we have conversations which, if you overheard them, we took them out of context, would give you a very poor opinion of us as human beings, frankly, because we all know each other. We know the context in which we're talking and we know what our underlying opinions and values are. And so we feel free to make jokes which, taken out of context, uh, would be construed very badly indeed. Now, there's nothing actually physically to stop someone else being in the pub and recording us and putting it out on the internet. So far, touch wood, nobody has. 
but how, how public is public? So whose job would it be then to, to suppress those? And, and I think this is, this is one of the points around this specific case, right, to be forgotten, is it does kind of throw it into Google's lap to say, okay, well, we have to arbitrate now which of these things should or shouldn't be online. I mean, I, I compare it with libel laws, for example, and there's been quite a long battle in this country, which is still going on in Northern Ireland, I believe, about reforming the libel laws so that it's harder to use libel to shut people up when they're saying things about you that you don't like. Uh, regardless of whether those things are true or proven or, or any of those things. So have we just shifted the same dispute uh, into the lap of a search engine? What, what do people think? It, it feels a bit like, and this question of who's the gatekeeper or perhaps in a different context, um, who, who has the right or the power over a particular piece of, of information, it, it, it just feels like we've somehow got the whole thing completely backwards that the questions are really not of what should what what should be done once something's out there or been there for a long time. Again, this point, it's not really about forgetting. Um, it's about who has what rights and what obligations over, over what different kinds of pieces of information. And it, it, the, the naive thing, where, where certainly where I started, was, well, OK, it's my information, so we just need to invert all the technology so I control my information. And I can send things out to gather stuff that always comes back to me. But then, with my own example, I'm being paid out of the public purse, so there are some obligations that arise there. Or, you know, it's something that was developed by an investigative journalist, and they have rights over the information they've gathered and the story they're telling. Um, and they're probably contracted and doing work for hire for a company. And so, we have this very complex web of interactions and obligations and rights and responsibilities that we haven't really got figured out even where to start untangling it yet. And the right to be forgotten seems to be kind of trying to tackle it at the far end after this web has spread out into the world and cut off one little shoot at the end rather than address the problem at its source. So do you think it's a problem that should be addressed but in a different way? Yes, but I'm not quite sure what that other way is. So I, don't, <laughs> okay. I don't have a better solution. <laughs> But you don't think it's that. Josh, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, on the subject of Google as a on the subject of Google as a gatekeeper or something, I don't think it's necessarily um, an Orwellian Orwellian phenomenon because they point to material that's published by other people. In 1984, the government was just overwriting history and overwriting what was already there. Google don't necessarily do that. They they point to information that others have published. But what's telling is the fact that they have enough control over the information that we access online, the amount of search requests, the amount of information they serve is so great. I mean, if you look at the way they, they can, you, you can go do a search and at the bottom, you might see that some links have been removed under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So they're already capable of removing links on legal grounds. Search algorithms move things up, they move things down. If you get on the third page of Google results, you don't exist, effectively. So they, they, they have the power to do that. So they are on one, on one level, purely instrumentally, the logical place to put this because they have the power to implement it immediately because they control the algorithm. And they have the power to do that and they've proven they can do it over the copyright issue. The problem is I think that copyright issues tend to be much clearer cut. And as Kenneth was saying, you put in you put it to the point where the, the, the bar is set at a sufficient level that you can be confident that spurious, malicious, downright stupid requests are going to be filtered out really quickly. But it's the ones that sit at or just above or just below the bar are where it becomes troublesome for me. And that's where I think some kind of independence should be there. There should be a much more clearly defined oversight over the process and the power of appeal, not just for people, but for publishers. Because there might be a public interest case that hasn't been heard. And if the first you hear about it is when suddenly traffic to your page plummets, you haven't had a chance to put the other side. And that's what I think worries me about its implementation at the moment. I think my concerns are initially, when I thought about this, were that the only alternative would be some sort of Orwellian Ministry of Truth that sat there doctoring history and all the rest of it. But then the, the pictures in my mind changed. I, I saw um, Terry Gilliam's dystopia Brazil 
with all these arcane information processing systems that were um, you know, hugely broken. And it was the common person that was being chased from pillar to post to try and get resolution of what in, in its origin was a, a technical mistake, and that had been a mistake. Um, and this is where science fiction comes in, you see. Um, there, there are all these wonderful models that we know not to follow, but unfortunately, we haven't got around to generating, I, I suspect, enough of the really, really good ones. Um, my, uh, my other concern is that we create a huge bureaucracy, which, however well-meaning, um, will be the, the son or daughter of other bureaucracies. Um, and the only people who would win in the long term would be the people who manage those bureaucracies and presumably gasp lawyers. Any lawyers in the room? <laughs> <laughs> You've got the microphone, haven't you there? Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, this is probably quite a basic question as well, a bit following up from Jojo, just to make sure that I kind of know exactly what we're talking about. So if I understand correctly, uh, the European courts have said people have the right to be forgotten on very with a high threshold, but if I understand correctly, people can ap apply to Google directly and say, this is why I think this should be removed from the search engine, or do they have to go via the courts? So just to, so does Google have absolutely, as in if someone's created a law and now Google is arbitrating, or does it all go via the courts, in which case there is an independence, an independent person making that decision and then just telling Google, do it or don't do it, just to make sure that we clarify this. So unfortunately, there's been live stream, so you're going to have a flood of comments when I say this is completely wrong. Um, I, I'm, I'm not certain if you have to go through the courts, but you, the first step is that you have to contact the entity that posted the content and have had an unsatisfactory resolution, right? And there's a, and there's a few other standards that you have to hit, but but by the time it gets to Google, you've availed yourself of all the other remedies and failed. Right, so so there are other routes, but at the end of the day, you, you do go to Google. And, and, well, you you must, you know, if, if Google sees that you have not, I guess I think the, it's such that if if you haven't actually gone to those other things and try, and tried those things first, they just say do that. For, this is what you do. They send out the form letter. You have to do this, this, and this. You have to show there's been a meaningful attempt to get redress. From your problem in these through lots of other vehicles of which a court case could be one of them so the, again the threshold is high in that respect so there are ways to try, sort of because of course google is only the common carrier of they're the carrier pigeon of the information right i mean they're right when they say that um you should actually go to the, you know, the idiot on facebook who wrote the incorrect blog post about your drug about your alleged drug deal <laughs> I think I think that's the problem. And if, if you're either in the room or watching on the internet and you know better than this, I think that that's one of the sources of the objection is that other people who are involved in the same content and don't want it removed don't have any redress uh, if, if, if people are searching for one search term and not getting a result that features you anymore then you, you don't have any redress of that. Uh, but if I'm sorry, if you're if you're either on the internet or in the room and you know better than, than us on this, then do feel free to chip in. Uh, other other points, questions you yeah, have yeah, already? Uh, Fred from Frontiers. I just have a question about the aspect of uh, ubiquitous ubiqu ubiquitousness of data as a remedy. Um, I actually, you know, I think back of our poor 18-year-old who had this run-in with the police when he was 18, and what if actually it were true that he was he was dealing drugs behind the train station and he was arrested and he had this 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 incident with the police, and then this is 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 it fair that he carries this as part of his information baggage for the rest of his life? Uh, is there is there still somewhere in there, uh, you know, the ubiquitousness of, of data? Does that sort of freeze reality in some sense, and it's all of a sudden you're navigating in something which is crystallized, and and you, you, you your ability to maneuver has all, all has, has somehow been been greatly reduced. I don't know. Just I don't know if you have have any thoughts in this direction. Well, this is I mean, this is a much wider question, isn't it? Because 
regardless of the specific law about the right to be forgotten, more and more of our lives are on the internet and therefore both in public and kind of frozen in time forever. And more and more of us, we, thankfully, I did my really embarrassing bits of growing up before these things were invented, fact which I'm profoundly grateful for, although I, I dare say this does some embarrassing things. But more and more of us are going to grow up and have our embarrassing youth there somewhere in perpetuity on a server. Are we going to have to just rethink our attitude to our own past and other people's past? Are we going to have to completely change our social attitude to what people have done in the past? Uh, and, do the, and do these things, I mean, you seem to be suggesting that values actually come from the technology. If, if technology says we can preserve all the details of our lives, the, the cupcake I ate, in November 2014, the, the thing I did at the party for forever. Are we going to change our, our values about what these things mean? Or do we have to just get used to the idea that we're now answerable for everything we've ever done forever? I think my, my thought would be, are we talking about data or information that derives from the data? If we're looking at a set of things that have happened whether we remove the indexes to them or not in the search engines, they haven't done happened. They're still out there. But what we can do is, is develop uh, whatever the societal norms are that allow us to report on that set of data. So is something that happened yesterday more important than something that happened 10 years ago? Do we treat it like a discount rate in government economics? Um, how do you apply weighting to a crime or a good deed and how do you balance them? I think these are things that we haven't thought of because we've, we've never had this much data to generate information from and we don't really understand what questions we want to ask yet. So we, we need like an algorithm for forgiveness or tolerance of past failures. Well, I'll sign up for that. I, just, I think we just need to, I mean, it's some, it, it does feel a bit peculiar that we really, maybe we just need to grow up a little bit and realise that people change. Um, that things we have got into this in politics in particular, we seem to get into this really strange place where something a politician is not allowed to change their mind because that's a sign of weakness. So something they said five years ago is now going to be held against them for all time. And and you know, a mistake you made in your childhood can potentially be held against you for all time. So John and John pointed out that the last time I was on stage and we were both um, involved in this conference about three or four years ago. I was sitting there saying that Google Wave was the future of scholarly communication. And most of you probably can't even remember what Google Wave was. I was wrong. <laughs> you know, I, I, it turns out I wasn't correct. I made a mistake. Um, the world has moved on, and, and I think I'm allowed to say that, you know, I said that at the time, and these are the reasons why the world's moved on and why I was wrong. Um, and we just, we, it is, it's the discount rate, it's the, you know, if we're not, if we have more data about how we're growing as human beings, then maybe we should celebrate the fact that we can grow and become better and learn, rather than freeze everyone's personality and aspect. Um, you know, again, it's the, do I have the right, does the society have the right to, to require me to be the same person I was five years ago? That seems that seems a very strange place to be. Very profound question. Uh, there's a yeah. hand up there. there? Um, so oh, um, there's, a, there's a hand up here. Just just to, sorry. Yes, you. And then afterwards, you give the microphone to the balcony. Carry on. Just to um, open up another opportunity to talk about science fiction. Um, <laughs> David Brin, uh, I think, coined the phrase "radical transparency." And his his point is that the issue uh, with privacy is that there's an imbalance that some people have it and others don't. And the ones that have it are able to be hypocritical. They're able to go off and um, and create laws, you know, anti. If J. Edgar, if people had known that J. Edgar Hoover used to go around and drag, it would have been a little harder for him to go out and prosecute homosexuals and other what he considered to be sexual deviants. So the issue he would claim is just that um, we need transparency everywhere, um, all over the place, and that this will, in fact, um, then allow us to truly set social norms about what's acceptable 
uh, if it's clear that everybody has made mistakes in predicting uh, technological technological change, or that everybody has made mistakes with uh, you know with uh, drugs in their youth, or um, or prob or ill-advised photographs at parties, um, that it becomes less of a problem. Um, but the problem now is that there is a, a group that's able to actually hide that. And they tend to be the powerful ones, and they tend to be pass it ones that are passing the laws. So you'd be, you'd be in favor of more information. To be clear, no, I think he's mad, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while you're handing the microphone to the guy with the beard, who thinks that more transparency is generally a good thing? Okay, we've got a lot of people. Who thinks that more privacy would be a good thing? Well, it's, it's, yeah, and a lot of the same people. Not okay. Exclusive, right? yes. no, no. okay, there's another thing. Another thing to unpick. Okay, remember the beard. Hi, um, Joe. Um, on a tangent from what Cameron was saying, we have a concept of spent criminal convictions in the UK. And um, once you've served your time, you don't need to disclose it when you're applying for jobs. And of course, we're not saying that we should treat everything we've done in the past as a criminal conviction. But there is certainly for things you might have done when you were younger, um, maybe not legally accountable for them, perhaps. Um, there is precedent, um, if vaguely related, but still precedent of classifying certain data about yourself, which is now can be declared um, legally irrelevant. Do you think that we need a mechanism specifically that puts that into the online world? Because as far as I know, I mean, apart from this idea that you could ask for the for a search engine to suppress those results, there actually is no mechanism to say, well, okay, yes, I was convicted of that and I served my time and now legally that is spent. And yet if you go online, there's still the, the thing in the South Wales Herald that has me being dragged off in the police van after the court case. Do you think we need a specific way of doing the same thing in the online world as we can do in the kind of formal? Well, it might even be a question of how the online world interfaces with the real world at the other end. Um, I don't know all the motivations for the, the law that led to the spent convictions thing, but um, a major worry is what does the HR department think when they Google you and found you did inadvisable things as a child? Um, maybe you could say, fine, we're never going to solve the problem of that coming up on the web because it's a probably a fundamentally unsolvable problem. But we could say, um, you're, this is like a protected category of, of things you're legally not allowed to take into account. Perhaps, you know, especially if I was unaccountable as a child when I did you know, action X, maybe you can then say, you know, if you, did you not hire me because you found out that I'm, you know, reported to have done this. So maybe the solution could be um, to do with the offline repercussions rather than the reporting online. So how it's used rather than whether it exists. So there's, a, there's an analogy here, maybe, and it maybe comes back to this notion of greater transparency and what Jeff's was saying in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the idea that you could become legally non-liable by disclosing something that was done. So the act of making public actually was, was associated with not the, not having criminal liability um, for things that happened under the apartheid regime. And I don't know whether that's a, it's not something I really thought about before. Maybe it's an analogy that you could declare things and in declaring them they would become, in some sense, inadmissible in a court of human resources. Well, I'm really opening things up now. Um, Josh, I'm aware that because you're at that end, uh, you're not really getting much of a look in. Are, are you burning to say something, or are you just sitting pondering? I am sitting pondering, but uh, thank you. Um, but I, I'm also struck by the idea that the responsibility um, for the impact of the information lies with the people who are generating the impact rather than the people who are serving the information. I think that's a really useful inversion of the discussion because we talked a lot about whether Google should be separate, which should be um, the people to hold with, with, hold with, with uh, redact search links. Um, we've talked a lot about people's position within the information ecosystem, publishers and, and people that are in. But actually, if somebody is practice, if somebody is using this information for some kind of discriminatory hiring practice or something, they should be liable, not the source of the information. I think that's a very important point. Um, is that the it, it's we, we do need to grow up. We 
do need to take responsibility for the way we present ourselves in the world, but we also need to be free to make mistakes. I think that's really important, it's how we grow, it's how we learn. But it's how people exploit those mistakes or exploit the information about them to harm us or to have to, 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 to benefit themselves at our expense that I think should be much more under the subject and much more of the subject of examination of this because I think that's where the moral harm lies. So the right to make mistakes. Uh, did you want to? My name is Dennis. Um, I, I really like your inputs earlier on on the, the fact that there is a, uh, as in the ancient Greece, there was a, a change of the paradigm about like public speech, freedom of speech and everything. We might be uh, at the edge of a change of paradigm in terms of what is privacy, what is public information. And uh, of course, we are living in a time where we have a lot of fears about what would be, might happen in a few years in to ourselves because all the information about our childhood might, might be public on everything. Uh, but I want uh, this somehow uh, makes me think about uh, a term that was very common a few years ago in describing internet. There was the global village. I, I don't remember having heard this for a while. And basically the principle I'm sure you all remember but was that we are living in a time where, like in a small village of 300 inhabitants, everybody knows each other, everybody remembers what everybody, you know, all the other people did when they were at school, when they were drunk in the pub. And there is a some sort of form of uh, respect to each other because everybody did something wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and that, in a way, kind of... Uh, can be seen as a democratic uh, um, approach to the fact that, okay, we all did something wrong and thus I'm not considering your mistakes as bad as they would be if I find them on the internet. I wonder if we might uh, see uh, a change of this approach to the privacy maybe in the next 20 years where everybody and um, all the people that have an internet account on Facebook or whatever will have something to be ashamed of. And thus, the people in the HR department wouldn't be bothered too much in checking what they actually did before hiring the people and stuff. What, what do you think about that? That's, that's a very useful point. I mean, in a way, I kind of hope that's what would happen. But I have to say the evidence at the moment is that what we're getting is actually the opposite, that people are becoming quicker and quicker to condemn the smallest transgression of whatever code of conduct people feel you should be adhering to, uh, and that it takes almost nothing for the pitchforks to come out in social media, uh, and that, if anything, we seem to be becoming less tolerant and, and less forgiving. Um, I'll just take the, the first spot of the microphone. Did you want to say something, or are you just microphone? Okay. Um, so I recently went to a training course about social media. I was a job search thing. And, and a very interesting point was put to me because I'm a bit of a privacy addict perhaps. And it was actually point to me that the more private you are, the worse it looks. It looks as if you have something to hide. Uh, so I'm just wondering what you guys think about that. The more private you are, perhaps it's more detrimental to your image. <laughs> So you do not have to say anything on social media, but if you do not, that may be held against you. I suspect um, a lot of the writers in the room are very careful to maintain what they think of as a writerly profile for the consumption of editors, perspective, commissioning people, etc., etc. Um, I'm not sure that works. Um, for, all, for all the reasons you, you can understand. I mean, we are all lots of different people at the same time. Just by the very nature of who we are, we're a family member, we're a team member, um, we're people with hobbies, we're people that go down the pub, some of us. Um, it, it ties in a bit to me with the, the idea of the global village, which sounds wonderful and uh, idyllic and bucolic and all those other wonderful things. And, I've lived in a number of small villages. <laughs> and I, I have to say that 
some of them, and I won't, uh, with respect to the communications device in the corner, um, <laughs> some, some of them have, I have had a more deeply held, long-lasting schisms than major religious organisations have had. Um, they're not necessarily wonderful examples to develop from, although if we could have the bucolic, the, the Disney-fied version, that would be very nice. Really? You'd really like to live in a Disney village? I'd like to have the opportunity to try. <laughs> Uh, we've got, have we got things coming in online? Just, uh, just no, a question from me, actually. The communication device in the corner, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Nicole, for those of you that haven't met me. My question goes slightly, ever so slightly off topic, but as I'm listening to all this, the thing I'm completely overwhelmed with is not just the amount of data that we're dealing with now, but as we continue to digitize things and we continue to put things online and have algorithms for X, Y, and Z, as someone who's worked with an inordinate amount of data from a genetic perspective, what is going to happen to all this data? Are people thinking about just the sheer amount of data and the kind of prioritizing that might happen? Isn't there a possibility that there's a lot of data that's just going to become superfluous noise because we won't have the capacity to deal with it, we won't have the speed to deal with it, and we won't have the algorithms to actually make any real sense of it? Maybe. So that, being so flooded with data. Yeah, uh, you will. You will give us a shout, won't you? If some of those questions are coming on. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, so yeah, panel on, on yeah. any of those. <coughs> um, I I bet against uh, the implication of where you're heading that the data becomes superfluous and you just sort of lose it anyway, uh, because I think it's going to be more likely that things will evolve that the data just sort of lingers around and that we can find it when we want to and need to. And the best example of that is whenever we all buy computers, we typically don't replace it and get, say, 10% or 20% more memory. We buy our new computer two years later and we get like four times the amount of memory. So we just basically drag over our entire desktop from our other computer and now we've got maybe three times as much memory to play with. And we never delete digital photos. It takes more time and effort to actually look at the photo and delete it than it does just to keep it there because the cost of keeping it there is so low because just a couple of gigabytes, right? Just a couple hundred gigabytes. It's not going to be map. It's not going to matter much anymore. So th that's the first part of it. The second part of it is well, the utility. It's almost axiomatic that we collect data, thinking that we're collecting it for one purpose, and that years later, maybe decades later, people identify secondary purposes with which that it can be put towards, with which it was never thought of at the point of collection when the primary purpose of the collection was made. An example in the book that I co-wrote, Big Data, was a fellow named Commodore Mori. And what Mori did was he was, the, after getting crippled by a stagecoach accident, it was around 1830, 1840 in the US, was put in, in charge of the head of the deep, a depot of charts and instruments in the US Navy. And he, uh, and he saw all these old musty crates at the basement in Washington, D.C. of this organization. He said, what are these? And the person said, oh, these are log books. Uh, we're going to throw them out. He said, not so fast. And so there were every shipman in, uh, every ship captain in the United States used to keep it sh uh, um, in, the, in the U.S. Navy, not in the merchant marine, used to keep a ship log, of course, of where they were. And after the end of their ship journey, they would send it in. They had to as a requirement. Well, he remembered as a sailor that whenever he would try to go anywhere, the, the nautical maps were completely useless because it only told you geography. It didn't tell you what the typical wind current would be. It didn't tell you what the typical waves would be like. It didn't tell you what the temperature was typically like or, the, or the, all the features of the patterns of, of the weather and of the current. We knew as sailors that they were actually, uh, they responded to patterns, but but the maps didn't identify that. So what he did is he literally had people the called computers take the logbooks, take a map, and identify what was going on at that time. All of the readings that were embedded into the logbooks. He did it. He had, oh, it took him de a decade. He got a million data points. He created a whole new nautical map based on what the given wind direction would be, wind speed, temperature of the water, current of the water, direction of the current. And by doing so, we were able to create the shipping universe that we have today. Um, and he, you know, typically it would, it would take one third the time and be far safer, right? Usually on journeys, I mean, it was hard to insure because you know, often ships would just go into what's called the doldrums and they couldn't get anywhere, run out of water. They would get no uh, wind and they, everyone would perish. So it was, a, it was a stretch up in the Atlantic. 
he was able to identify that through data that was collected for totally different reasons. So I think that what we're going to have in the future is just this. We'll be collecting data. We don't think it has a purpose. And 100 years from now, we're going to see an incredible purpose and we'll save people's lives and the world will be a better place for it. So I think that we're going to be living with the world of permanent information and the ubiquity of information, whether we like it or not. Josh, anything to add? No, I'd agree with that. I agree with that completely. I think there's assuming, assuming that technology persists. Um, um, but I think, and the ability to continue to develop it, but I think that one of the things that we're looking at today is not just about all that data, all that health data, all those educational outcomes, everything else. It's about specific statements that have been made about us online. And I think that in the grand scheme of things, most of us aren't relevant enough that that information will be of value to anybody in the future. Our health outcomes might be. The treatments that we were given for specific illnesses and the way that turned out will be crucially important. The fact that someone has a picture of me wearing a silly hat being sick is probably not very likely to be as valuable to future generations. I think there's a point here where you have to accept that your own irrelevance is in many cases the best defense in the long run because the stuff that's printed about you, the stuff that the, 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 folk, the, the millions and millions of digital images of, of us behaving like fools that are available on the internet for everyone to enjoy um, are not going to last as valuable data in the sense that the data that Kenneth is talking about will. And that, will, that, value, that value will grow and the relevance and the value and the potential for harm of things will fade eventually, given enough time. Uh, okay, we're nearly out of time. So was that Savannah with a, a um, question? Can I just uh, ask a quick question and I'll yes. pass it across? Yes, so you ask a question, then pass it up here, and then I will ask the, the panel to sum up very quickly. But if you have got a question, just sort of, uh, and you can put it briefly, stick your hand up now, and we'll try and put you on. Yeah, uh, Rowena Fletch, you would. I just wondered whether you thought that there was um, an argument, uh, given all this discussion, not to make any changes to um, privacy or transparency until we learn to be more responsible with dealing with what private data we get at the moment. Okay, so keep things as they are until we change our behavior. My question was really, we, we've talked a bit about sort of HR departments and perhaps misusing some of this and, and, and things like this. And we've talked about sort of Google being told to forget things. Well, Google doesn't have a true monopoly. There are other people who allow you to search for data. And if there is sort of known that Google plays the game and Google takes off the data, but say DuckDuckGo doesn't, surely people who are interested in the sort of the narrowing down your background will just go to the places that aren't forgetting that are keeping that and allowing you to find it um, surely the legislation only can go so far and it can't necessarily protect sort of cases like that well i, I believe we, all you have to do is go to google's american site actually so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very easier. imperfect technological solution uh, any other quick thoughts from the audience I, I, I'm, I feel we've only scratched the surface of this and I probably need a whole other session on why privacy and transparency are completely compatible because uh, I'm not entirely convinced. Go on, you have to be quick there because you've already had a... And then I'll, I'll come back to you guys for maybe try and sum up in a minute or two. Just a really tiny point of information to kind of uh, spin this off <laughs> towards the end. Um, the, group, the BBC said they would publish uh, a list of all the articles that have been banned from Google. <laughs> there you go, go to the BBC. Uh, okay, in that case, uh, panel, if you'd like to give us your final thoughts in a, in a minute or two, should we get the same order to start with? Yeah, sure. Um, I am hopeful for the future because um, I like to be cheerful about stuff. So I think it was Douglas Adams who said, along the lines of, let's all try being nice to each other for a change. So if we did that, all this problem would go away. <laughs> there you go. The future through niceness. Yeah. Josh. Um, I think there's a deeper issue that comes out of this, which is not necessarily that we, we, can, we, we should or should not be able to control the data that flows around us, but I think most of us don't understand the data that we are producing and the trails that we are leaving. And I think there's a bigger issue here um, where I think people need to understand how that data is being used. The area where there needs to be more transparency is in the collection and the use and the reuse 
and the sharing of data. I think that's that that's a far bigger ethical concern, and I think it affects all of us much more materially than many people realise. So I think the the thing that struck me is that a lot of what we're talking about are concerns about power asymmetry. Um, who has the power to do what to what? So the the last question, you know, could you just go to DuckDuckGo and DuckDuckGo can just undermine the whole thing by offering something that Google doesn't do. And my concern in, to Nicole's question is not so much is more data available, but do we have control over who can do stuff with it? If we don't control the capacities required to manage it or find things out from it, but only other people, only the Googles of the world can, where does that leave us? Um, which may take me more to Kenneth's point than I was expecting um, in the end. But I think it comes down, I, you know, I think there are great positives that come out of this. We always worry about, we always concerned about the downsides. Um, there are huge opportunities here if we can find the ways to talk about these things and understand how to balance rights and responsibilities. And that's, if, if we do it properly, then hopefully we do become you know, more democratic, more inclusive, more engaged, and more informed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think this has been very enlightening. Um, and one of the themes that came out was, wouldn't people just change? If, if the values change, or, if, or if they're so they're seeing this ubiquity of information, should shouldn't they um, develop an awareness that they don't have already, uh, and balance uh, what they're seeing online that information with the fact that oh boys will be boys, or you know that was just a youthful transgression, and we all have such things. And I think the answer is yes, that will be the end state that we get to, where we all and I and I think it's clear we're already seeing that. Uh, Cameron, you pointed out. Um, Dana Boyd's book is complicated that says that kids are going in that direction. The problem, of course, is that that change, the change of heart, change of human nature, takes a long time. It's slow. And so the right to be forgotten is sort of the solution of this generation, sort of the, the digital um, imposters uh, that they impose on the technologies uh, while the digital natives will go forward. And I think they'll see it as an archaic law, maybe in 100 years, probably earlier. The interesting thing, though, is you can see that if it does take a long time, how long might it be? And so one way within our own framework, our own lives, that we can see a sea change has been in politicians and the use of drugs. So in the American political context, I don't know in Britain, which is unaware of it, but um, famously uh, a fellow by the name of Judge um, I want to say Ginsburg, not Ruth, uh, it was an earlier one, uh, was nominated for the Supreme Court. And uh, he was asked whether it was a loaded question, but he knew the answer whether he had actually, is it true that he had smoked pot when he was at Harvard Law School? Well, Harvard Law School is such a boring place, and of course you need to smoke pot to <laughs> go to lectures. Nevertheless, um, he admitted, yes, he had, and that was enough to scotch his, um, his nomination, gone. Okay, so Clinton, right, famous Clinton, um, was asked a similar question when he was running for president, and he said he, he didn't inhale. <laughs> okay. Now, Christopher Hitchens, who apparently was at Oxford at the time, that he was a Rhodes Scholar, said, yeah, of course he didn't inhale, we baked it into the brownies. But nevertheless, <laughs> it, it's true, it's true, he said he didn't inhale, so he became president. That was fine. The American people accepted that. And of course, in Obama, famously in his memoirs, Obama goes on for pages about how much drugs he took. So it's, it is to say that it took about 25 years, 30 years, but it does change. These values do change. They are. Well, I feel we've opened up lots of questions, not answered any of them. So I look forward to everybody's blog posts and tweets with hashtags. And if we're all wrong about everything, unfortunately, it's now recorded for posterity and we'll be on the internet forever. So uh, thank you. <laughs> please thank all the panel and thank you all for your questions. Thank Nicole for um, 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 the volunteers with the microphones and uh, enjoy the next session. Thank you all.